The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said to his disciples, when the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who comes from the Father, he will testify on my behalf. You also are to testify because you have been with me from the beginning. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. But now I am going to him who sent me, yet none of you asked me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your hearts. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away, for I to, if I do not go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove the world wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because they do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I am going to the Father and you will see me no longer. About judgment, because the ruler of this world has been condemned. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. The Gospel of the Lord. Bow your heads with me in prayer. Gracious Lord, we thank you for this wonderful, amazing Pentecost that you have created and allowed us to share in. This morning, Lord, would you take our minds and think through them. Take my lips and speak through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire with love for your son, Jesus. Take our wills and put them in submission to yours. In Jesus Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Well, good morning. Good morning. You, you eight o'clockers, you know it's nine. You 10 o'clockers, you know at nine. Say hi to the person next to you. It is always one of my favorite services to bring you all together. Wonderful. That's what the Holy Spirit does. That's why I think it's imperative we have one service on Pentecost because we're all supposed to be together anyway. So um, I know only one person who was a little early. Uh, I don't know if anybody's going to be late, but... Uh, the Holy Spirit's still here, so we're good to go. Um, so these last few weeks or months or so, we've been finishing up John's letter, and we kind of summarized it by suggesting that John is telling the people, here's how you testify to your relationship with Jesus in these ways, not sinning, not fearing and loving. Then he talks about how God testifies to his existence and, and his purpose. And he summarized it last week by saying, the testimony, the preaching, the proclaiming, the living, leads to faith, we hear it, we believe it, which then leads to the life, the life of God, the life that Christ came to give us, to wake us up to, to bring us home to. And there's two scriptures that we heard today from Ezekiel and Acts, strangely enough, are both involved in this burgeoning forth, this exploding, this flowing of life coming from God and showing the world what he is doing. And strangely, there are some similarities. Ezekiel and the disciples, the apostles, were all called and chosen for a purpose. They were prepared. If you know about Ezekiel earlier in the book, he eats a scroll, probably not a real scroll, but he's prepared, just as the disciples are for three years, to proclaim the testimony of God. And if you didn't notice, in the midst of that testimony, God likes to show off. He really, really does. And I think he does that sometimes, not only because he can, but because he knows that we need our attention grabbed. We need to be woken up. Whispers work, hands on shoulders work, healings work, words of love and forgiveness work. But sometimes, I don't know about you, but man, it's great to see a fireworks show from God. And so he shows up powerfully in these stories today, in Ezekiel and the day of Pentecost. And you see the life of God, the Holy Spirit, blowing forth in both interesting and impressionable ways. When I was bartending uh, in seminary, uh, this was 2009, 2010, I had a lot of auspicious meetings with people from my younger life. I was bartending in the town where I grew up, which if any of you have any idea what that means, it's weird. I was in my 30s and people I hadn't seen in 20 years are coming in, they're like, Charlie? 
teachers were coming in, people who I didn't get along with were coming in, etc., etc. And one day I had an auspicious meeting when I see at my bar and she looked exactly the same 20, 25 years later, my elementary school music teacher. It was awesome. And we caught up, how are you, how are your family, you know, what are you doing, blah, blah, blah. But I really had one question for her. All those years, for 10 or 15 years, I had been humming a song that I learned in that class. And I could never figure out what it was. I knew that I had seen it during her class. It was a Halloween thing. There was a cartoon of dancing skeletons, Ezekiel. That's why I'm telling you the story. And then there was this beautiful classical music piece. And I hummed it, and I hummed it, and I hummed it for 15, 20 years. And then she walked in the door. So I got her settled, got her food, got her beer. It's a beer bar. And then I was like, All right, I got to ask. And I hummed a couple, and she goes, oh, yes. That's Dance Macabre by, by Camille Saison. Some of you know this. It is beautiful. This cordant violin is the angel of death playing to the skeletons in a graveyard. He shows up at night and he comes in and he starts playing. And the skeletons wake up and they start dancing. Very impressionable for a fourth grader, right? And the music stayed with me for 20, 25 years. I listen to this music now when I need energy, when I need life, when I want to be inspired. It starts a little slow and it ends slow because the angel of death is waking them up and then he's helping them dance and then the sun comes up so he slows it back down. And for 20, 25 years, I remember this piece. And last week, I finally looked up, what is Dance Macabre? And some of you may know this, that the, the history goes back to the 14th century in Europe. It was this artistic, cultural thing that the people used during these wars in Europe in the 14th century, during the plagues. They would draw and do wood impressions and paintings of dancing skeletons as a reminder of their mortality. It was an ironic, cheeky way to say they would hold them up, put them in their house, we're all going to die. 400 years later, Camille Saison writes this piece of music, and I hear it, and I'm like, I don't feel like I'm going to die. I want to dance like the skeletons. Now you can imagine, every time I read Ezekiel 37, do you know what comes in my head? That piece of music. And the irony is it was created as an idea to remind people they were going to die. But for me, and when you saw this cartoon, it was all about life. Skeletons coming to life. I don't know if they knew about Ezekiel 37, if they used that, but it's there for me. That image. Last week, I also, for the first time ever, expanded my search on YouTube, and I put Camille Saint-Saëns, Dance Macabre, Skeletons. And then I scrolled down, and 30 or so down, there it was. I'd never seen it since I was in elementary school <laughs> years ago. It was a PBS special that they gave to elementary school music teachers to inspire the kids to listen to classical music. And they used this cartoon of dancing skeletons at Halloween to do it. And I never forgot that song is ingrained in my brain and the dancing skeletons. Now, that's just me, 20 years, watching a cartoon in a music room. What do you think that impression made on Ezekiel? The story of God taking him in the spirit to this vision or whatever it was, to a land, a valley of dry bones that come to life and start moving, he would never forget that, ever. Do you know how we know he never forgot? Because 2,700 years later, we just read it today. You can't forget Skeletons coming to life. The life of God flowing through them. God taking this man and making him a prophet to say, you're going to tell my people this is what's going to happen to them. Life is going to fill them. Even though they feel like at their end of the rope, at the end of the road, they've lost all faith, they've forgotten who they are, you're going to preach the message of life and remind them that they are not dead, they are alive. Now, do you begin to hear Pentecost? Because if, if Ezekiel 
If I remember these dancing skeletons, if it's impressionable, what happens when things impress upon you? What is it easier to do the next week at home or at the office or in church 25, 35 years later to tell you the story? Sometimes I think God makes these big shows because he knows that we will never forget them. And so we can tell them forever. I will never forget the story of how I heard that piece of music. Ezekiel probably told that story until he died. God shows up and blows things up in our minds and our hearts because I think he wants us to remember so that we can then do what? Testify to it. Just like on Pentecost. Can you imagine? I mean, dancing skeletons is one thing. Rushing winds, spirit, tongues like fire. I don't even know what that means. Various languages, probably not all the languages we use, but all this cacophony of noise and power and life coming forth from these disciples. You think it made an impression? 2,000 years later, we're wearing red. 2,000 years later, we're saying, happy birthday, church, happy Pentecost. Thank you, God, for setting us forth on the mission you have given us to testify to what you have done for us. And that's what Pentecost is and was. It was the moment where God showed up in this magnificent way, not unlike Ezekiel, and said, here's what I'm doing for you. Do you see and hear and feel the power of life flowing through my people? This life that I created you for, that you were intended for, this life with me, this life in Christ, this life that I think humanity forgot about. I often use this space for a variety of visual arts, and sometimes I use it as the garden. You've been here, you've seen that. This is us. I don't need to be in the garden. And the further you get away from somewhere you've been, what happens? You forget. And the more you get involved in the world of sin and death and self, you bury yourself in a hole. People I know who are deeply depressed or deeply burdened by the world, I often say the phrase, burying, digging your own hole. Because what happens when you get in a hole? You can't see outside of it. All you see is the darkness around you. This is a metaphor for humanity. We walked out of the garden and we forgot that we were literally created by God for God to be with God. And God was like, I love you so much. And I know you keep forgetting. So you know what I'm going to do? Every once in a while, I'll whisper to you. Every once in a while, I'll put a hand on your shoulder. But every once in a while, fireworks, dancing skeletons, tongues of fire, various languages. I can't even believe what was happening. Because God wanted to wake us up from our memory loss. Which brings me to my movie reference. How many of you have seen the movie Hook? And if you haven't, this is actually a movie I can say, go see, it's a family movie, it's worth seeing, it's glorious, 1991. Robin Williams plays Peter Pan, who has grown up to become Peter Banning. It's a very interesting take on the story of Peter Pan. Peter grows up to be this self-involved, addicted to work banker. All he does is work. He has no time for fun with his kids. He tells them to shut up all the time. He's too busy for his life. All he's doing is making deals and making money. But somebody didn't forget about him. You see, Captain Hook wasn't done with Peter Pan. And so like 50 years later, Captain Hook is still wanting to get rid of Peter Pan. You know, their arch at nemesis, arch battle. And so he sends his goons to London to kidnap Peter Banning's kids and leaves a note, come fight me one last time. Captain Hook has a little bit of a chip on his shoulder. He wants this one last sword fight so that he can get rid of and vanquish that dastardly, life-giving, joyful young boy named Peter Pan. So he steals his kids. Peter Banning has no idea what this means. He has no idea that he was Peter Pan. He totally forgot who he was. Even though Grandma Wendy has told him and he's grown up with the story, he thinks it was just a story until things start happening. Tinkerbell, played by Julia Roberts, which is weird, shows up and takes him to Neverland. We're gonna get your kids, you're gonna fight Hook, it's all gonna be great. So she takes him there and he ends up on the pirate ship. Remember, he thinks he's Peter Pan. 
Banning, this huge banker out of London. And there he is on a pirate ship with pirates and Captain Hook, and Captain Hook's like, we're going to battle to the death. And Peter Banning whips out his checkbook. How much is it going to cost to get my kids back? He has no idea. They tell him to fly. He's like, fly? I can't fly. So Captain Hook's like, fine, you can't do any of that. I'm just going to kill you. And Tinkerbell's like, no, 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 no. Give me a few days to get him ready. He'll be in ready shape in three days, and then you can have your last battle, and you can vanquish your foe, Peter Pan. So they do. Peter goes off with the Lost Boys, his old friends, who he still has no idea who they are. And for a couple days, he's training to battle. He's learning to sword fight. He's learning to do things. They're trying to get him to fly, and he can't do it because he has totally forgotten who he was. At one moment, they're sword fighting, and Peter ends up on the ground. And this is the moment. This little boy comes up to him. It gets me emotional. If you've seen the movie, the kid is so precious. And he's pulling at Peter's face because they don't believe it's Peter. And he's like, hold on. And he goes up to him and he starts pulling at his face. And he goes like this. And he goes, oh, there you are, Peter. He was there the whole time. He just forgot. And over the next day, a bunch of weird things happen. He gets hit in the head with a baseball, and then he remembers. He can fly. He can crow. It's making this loud noise. He can fight. And he goes, and he has the big thing, and he doesn't kill Hook. The alligator does, and the whatever. And he gets his kids, and he goes home. And here's the irony of the whole thing. Hook kidnapped his kids so that he would come so he could kill him. And instead, Hook ends up bringing him back to life. Peter Banning now remembers he was Peter Pan, and he goes back to London filled with this power of life and joy and peace, and he wants to play with his kids and live with his wife and shower the world with joy. Oh, there you are, Peter. That's us. Buried within each one of us, from the beginning of creation to this very moment, is that moment in that movie. Each one of us has forgotten in some way, for generations, for eons, that God created us for us, with him, for his world, his life, with Jesus Christ. And we just forgot. And those of us in here who believe, we still forget from time to time. And God reminds us from time to time, sometimes in whispers, sometimes in fireworks, but God loved us so much that he sent his son and his Holy Spirit to wake us up from the memory and say, there you are. You just forgot who you were intended to be. And don't be dissuaded from the truth of what actually happened on Pentecost because John tells you in the gospel today, he sent the Holy Spirit, yes, to be our advocate, our comforter, to be the power of God in our lives, absolutely. But more especially to tell us the truth. Not only the truth of who God is and what God has done and how he created us for this purpose, but to remind us and to wake us up with tongues of fire and rushing wind and memories of dancing skeletons that we were created for something so much more glorious. And we've forgotten. And the Holy Spirit comes to tell us that truth, to confirm it in your hearts that you were not created to fall into a hole. You were created to sit in heaven with angels and archangels and praise God with Jesus for eternity. That's why you were created. And the day of Pentecost was God fully coming through his disciples, through his apostles, at the behest of his son, Jesus Christ, who said, tell them the truth, call them in power, send them forth to testify this is what they were made for, so that they could hear, receive, and believe, and come to join in that life as well. And then the beauty of it is that it becomes an ever life-giving circle. Once you have in faith come into the life the calling becomes your calling, my calling, to testify, not just in doing good things for people who are crossing streets or at the, you know, the store or people in need. Yes, do that. 
but to actually with your mouth or your heart proclaim Jesus is Lord and I was created for something so much more glorious than what it appears that I am created for. To remind yourself in heart and head and soul, oh, there I am, made in the image of God for his purposes, for his life in Christ. That's what the Holy Spirit was doing 2,000 years ago. Beginning officially the ministry to tell the world the truth of who we are meant to be in Christ. So, happy birthday, church. For the 2,000th time, you were created to be with God, in God, by Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit. The life that you think is holding you down is not the real life you were made for. You are meant to fly, metaphorically speaking, like Peter Pan, to be filled with that life, to see dancing skeletons, to hear tongues of fire. This is what you were created for. And the Holy Spirit came and comes still to remind you today through the music and through the sermon and through our praise and worship and through each other that this is what you were created for, the life of God in Jesus Christ, today, tomorrow, and always. To God be the glory forever and ever. Amen.